It's not going to be hybrid theory. It's not going to be minutes to midnight. And if we do it right, it'll have a cutting-edge sound that defines itself as an individual record separate from anything else that's out there. Well, at least he didn't lie to us. <laughs> When I started making the series Regretting the Past, I always had one album to cover in the back of my mind. God bless us, everyone, we were broken, people living under loaded guns. A Thousand Sons is the reason I wanted to start reviewing albums. Even though I didn't officially begin doing this regularly until almost two years after it came out, I still remember this album as being the reason why. And after many ongoing requests to cover this album and hitting the Patreon goal, it's time to bite the bullet. As for my original experience with the album, at the time I worked for a company about 45 minutes away from my home. So on the day this album came out, September 8th, 2010, I bought it hard copy from Best Buy and shoved it into the car stereo for the long ride home. And it's a miracle I didn't drive into oncoming traffic. When I first heard this album in entirety, I was beside myself. I didn't even know how to process what I had just heard. On the heels of hearing the new song Catalyst and being built up to the next evolution from arguably the flag bearers of good new metal, we were presented with a track list that sounds like aliens got a hold of it and tried to use their technology to scramble any sense of music understanding and writing process. I'm not going to sit here and argue that every song on this album sucks, because they don't. Some of them are pretty good, but this is a concept album, and despite the messages and the concepts, the songs overall are very difficult to get through as a whole. Listening to this album in entirety feels like a chore. Think of a server at your favorite restaurant trying to tell you about how amazing the new salad is. You like salad and you've been going to the restaurant for years so you're all for it. When it comes, you see some of the ingredients you recognize and enjoy like spinach and tomatoes. But then they dumped in battery acid and staples and called it their new vision. Linkin Park for years has been a spectacle. They were the outliers in many different genres, including the one they belong to, completely in a world of their own. So when the first new song called The Catalyst was presented, along with a quote from Mike Shinoda about their upcoming venture, it got many people to bite. Many people, like me, had this since day one, paid $9.99. Most expensive coaster ever. A Thousand Sons is undeniably Linkin Park's most polarizing album. There are very few people who have a middle ground on it. While the most common opinion is that it is the weakest offering from Linkin Park, there are others who admire it and call it their magnum opus. So instead of me just complaining about how A Thousand Sons is Linkin Park at their worst, which I really think, let's hear from someone who has the opposite opinion, who thinks A Thousand Sons is Linkin Park at their best. Let's hear briefly from Mark at Spectrum Pulse, who has his own YouTube channel covering music, movies, culture, and a lot more. Let me blow your mind and say, I'd argue that A Thousand Sons is Linkin Park's best album. Certainly their most ambitious in terms of sound and concept, with strong melodies, pretty solid hooks, great production, and as good of writing as you'd usually find in a Linkin Park album. Yeah, is it messy and kind of all over the place? Yeah, but that's true of most Linkin Park albums. It hasn't aged nearly as badly as Hybrid Theory. And you could argue that most of modern rock started following in Linkin Park's more electronic direction with a lot less success. Look, A Thousand Suns might be far from perfect, but it's definitely underrated. There you go, a preemptive counterpoint to someone who enjoys this album. Now it's my turn. A Thousand Sons is a conceptual album told in a way that the actual concept is a mess. While there are moments of clarity and unison where things match and the music becomes enjoyable, a majority of this album is completely wasted space that is instantly forgettable after you hear it, save a few actual songs. And also the terrible songs as well. Oh, you will remember the bad stuff after you hear it once. Put aside the name Linkin Park. If this album were made by any other band, it wouldn't have even been panned, but completely passed over and ignored. The only reason it is defended so highly by so many people is because there are die-hard Linkin Park fans who refuse to acknowledge that something may not be up to par by this band. Now I know there are some Linkin Park fans out there that have watched up to this point in the video who are already furious. Your hands are shaking at the keyboard, ready to type out your first hate comment without even watching the rest of the video. So let's make one thing perfectly clear. I like Linkin Park. Quite a bit, actually. When I was 14, I was the kid with the hybrid theory poster in my bedroom. In a school and community where hip-hop was really the only thing deemed worthy to listen to, Linkin Park was one of the groups I listened to and even got others into after hearing songs like Paper Cut in the end. That brings us to the first point of why we should regret a thousand songs, along with other albums that also fit into this category. 
thousands of people bought this album and defend it to death today just because of the name associated with it. Just like Metallica, it's possible for a good band to put out a bad album. It's okay to say that when a band changes things up or goes in a different direction that it doesn't work out. You can love an artist or band and still accept that not everything they've done is an absolute treasure. Unless you like Simple Plan. Then you just have to accept that you were wrong back in junior high and high school and everything of theirs is just terrible. In this video, I want to prove that you can like a band like Linkin Park, but still hate something they produce, and show you track by track why A Thousand Suns is a chaotic misfire. So let's go track by track and figure out why A Thousand Suns burned many fans. And just to be clear, once again, I don't hate everything on this album. For one thing, I definitely don't hate this opening track. Now this is how you start an album. It's haunting and creative, and you instantly get the feel of the electronic side of Linkin Park. It starts with a little girl singing the lyrics we have heard from the Catalyst before the album came out. It's slow pace, and it sets a tone. And apparently Linkin Park also thought this was a great way to start the album, so they decided to go with another intro right after the first. Two people laughed. Two people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. What the heck? Why is this here? I understand that A Thousand Sons is supposed to be thematic and carry more messages, but why would you open the album just to reopen it? You separated out a track just for this? If you really wanted it in the album, could you have at least added it to the Requiem? Or on the end of a song? This is the start of one of the big problems I have with A Thousand Sons, the track listing. The layout of songs and interludes feels very disjointed and oddly organized. It may not be my story to tell, but I think most listeners, including Linkin Park fans, know that tracks should flow into each other and the songs continue with one another, as opposed to just having an ominous backing track layered to fade into each song and make it seem like things are connected when they really aren't. Some of you might say it's an interlude. Interludes can be done very well and do add to many albums in a great way, but I honestly don't buy this as an interlude because one, it's only one minute into the album, and two, it connects an opening track to the first actual song. It's not that it's a bad track, it actually sounds okay, but it makes no sense to start the album off with an intro and then have this separated track right after. Or the second intro, or first interlude. I don't even know what to call this. Let's jump into the music. The opening song on this album, it actually feels like something worth checking out. The backing track has simple effects with synthesized drums and piano, and the guitar adds a lot to it in the bridge. It feels like a natural song that belongs on an album. Even if vocally it sounds like Chester is bored, it still sounds fine. The problem I have with Burning in the Skies, along with a few other songs on this album, is that this album was crafted to carry a message, meant to have something deeper. The lyrics in the song are not any more meaningful or deep than anything from Minutes to Midnight. It reads and sounds like high school poetry. The only message is regret. That's it. Again, I do not think this song is bad, but it feels like it could have been something much bigger if lyrically it stood for something more than looking back at the past. Slightly disappointing, but it's not bad. Maybe that's just my opinion, and I'm sure that a lot of people like this song, and I can kind of see why. And I'm sure from now on the music's gonna pick up a little bit more. You like that? Wasn't that worth your time? What the heck? Four tracks and we only have one real song to listen to so far? Why would they separate this out at all? It makes no logical sense. A Thousand Suns, for the many fans it has polarized for Linkin Park, is supposed to at least have a message, a concept. This was supposed to be something different and containing several focuses on different social issues. But in the first four tracks, we heard a good haunting first track, a confusing continuation, one actual song, and then some crickets at night behind a crisis. What am I supposed to get out of this so far? Alright, I understand there has to be a slow build, and there's bound to be at least one good track. One. 
So I'm sure things are just building up and they're trying to set up an atmosphere for the concept and the theme of the album. I mean, this isn't just gonna be a flatline roller coaster, right? Right? Does the chorus contain Chester singing an African tribal chant? What the heck is this? The static in the guitar and the harsh rhythm sound incredibly jarring. Mike Shinoda does not sound his best and lyrically, this one falls flat. It's not until the last minute of the song where Chester and Mike sing in harmony that things actually sound like it could work, but it's too late. The song berates you with that chorus and atonal riff that makes you happy etc exists. This is another problem I have with some of the songs on A Thousand Songs. They clearly have an idea of what to create for about 60 seconds in a 4 minute song, and things seem like they could come together, but it only comes at the end of the track and you have to listen to a synthesized train crash in order to hear it. The journey isn't worth the destination. Not every song on A Thousand Sons falls into this description, but just think about how much better this album would be if the songs resembled the same unison and feel of the last 60 seconds in each track, when They Come For Me and Burning In The Skies are perfect examples of that. To be fair, we're only going into track 6 out of 15, so there's bound to be more full songs. It's not going to be just tons of more interludes, or intros, or third intros, or whatever. It sounds like movie trailer music, something just soft enough to play in the background when you see action or Transformers playing on the big screen, something to not distract from what you're seeing. Vocally, the song works for Chester's softer singing and the beat and synthesizer register well. Lyrically, it's a bit generic but not terrible. It's nothing special though. In all honesty, it really feels like you are listening to a void. Once the track is over, you forget you are just listening to music for a few minutes. There is no real punch or hook, it's just a soft track to help continue the ongoing theme of moving forward. Linkin Park, who at one point was known for having so much energy and dynamic sound, now resembles sad grocery store music with Robot Boy. However, this song actually does lead to something. Another 90 second break of non-music. Really? This was worth including? Do I really even need to say anything now? It doesn't sound bad, it has a nice flow, but it's completely unnecessary. But hey, why not, right? I mean, this is the fourth track of something that isn't an actual song. In a 48 minute album, I've listened through 19 minutes, and five of those minutes weren't even listed as songs that can be defined. Really think about it. Has anyone ever said, wow, I really want to listen to Jornada del Muerto right now? And I have listened to interludes and connecting sequence tracks intentionally. It can be done well, but this just feels like it's there to take up space. But finally, we get something good. And a lot of you are probably thinking I wouldn't say that at all about this album at this point, or that it just wasn't possible. Fair is fair. There are good songs on A Thousand Sons. I've talked before about songs having a build, and even though this one is a bit long, almost two minutes until it really picks up, this song has a great build overall, and it leads up to something fantastic. This is one of the reasons why Waiting for the End is a really good song, and it's buried on an album like this. The build with Chester's slow singing does feel like it could have been cut down a bit, mainly because after two minutes it feels like nothing is progressing, but once Chester finally cuts loose and Mike joins in, everything just lights up. The simple keyboard notes and percussion make the first half of the song simple, and then the drums take everything up a level with Mike Shinoda's lyrics. The guitar works finally appears with a great effect and the song becomes amazing. 
I think this track is one of Linkin Park's most memorable for a lot of reasons. It showcases what both singers are known for while slowly developing a song. The only real problem I have with it is that it comes almost halfway through the album. The previous seven tracks feel instantly forgettable, and that's when you realize the problem. The album doesn't have the sting that Linkin Park was at one time known for. Back on topic, Waiting for the End is good. Maybe even great, despite its possibly too long build. I am not gonna bash a song just because it's on an album that is wholly bad, when the song is still really good. There are plenty of other bad songs on this album I can bash. The connecting ominous background static works to connect a song for about 45 seconds. Then the actual song starts. The lyrics come in a little faster for Chester, but then he starts screaming to a beat featuring a keyboard note loop, and it doesn't match. There are two dynamics that just don't mesh. Then at exactly halfway through the track, it all becomes an absolute mess. It's like a toddler got on top of his dad's mixing station and just went to town, pushing every button he could find. That is the only way I can figure out why the vocal pattern was made so randomly and chaotic. Then the tempo plummets and everything gets soft to some more electronic involvement. The last minute of the song is the only part that has any substance worth listening to with the singing of Come Down Far Below. Both Chester and Shinoda work together in unison and the song actually feels like a song worth listening to. A four minute track that has roughly 60 seconds of good material. And the rest of it sounds like an electronically mixed mess that Skrillex has when he's had too much ecstasy in Red Bull. What's next? What's next on the album? I think I want to go back to Ecstasy and Red Bull. I actually like the inclusion of Mario Savio's speech at the beginning, and I get the message the song is trying to continue. Lyrically, this track might be the strongest on the album. The problem with the song is that it's basically a track that's made to be remixed, meaning the song feels like it was made in editing software as opposed to instruments in a studio, and it will only end up being played at B-level nightclubs at 2am. Eventually, the song was made into several remixed and live edits. It's also another example of something that could have been much stronger than the final product. Mike Shinoda doesn't sound like he has the same fire, and Chester's chorus is the only real saving grace. It's not the worst thing I've ever heard, but it's disappointing. You can see that they had the pieces there, but they couldn't form it into something completely good from beginning to end. Just because a song has a message like this one, doesn't make the song automatically good. The same could be said for an interlude. I don't even know what to say. First of all, if you want to include motivational historical speeches in your album, that's fine. But do you have to stretch samples of them out into a techno void to create some apocalyptic nightmare? It completely deflates the intention of the speech's message, and if anything, it makes the album's intention counterproductive. Second, was this necessary? We have the speech in the middle of these songs as a break just to jump into more electronic chaos? It just exists. Like every other track break, intro, interlude, and whatever else they have in this staple acid salad. No one there to catch you in their arms. Do you feel cold and lost in desperation? You build up One of the themes in A Thousand Suns is post-nuclear attack. Even the term A Thousand Sons is a term taken from what survivors of World War II bombing saw. Reading the lyrics, it paints a great picture and it feels natural and organic to the mood. Even if the chorus tends to repeat a bit too much to possibly stretch the song, Iridescent still works on many levels. This is what I'm talking about with using the right pieces in the right way. If A Thousand Sons had more clarity and focus and less computer-generated rhythmic noise, then it could have been something. We are now on track 12 and only two songs are really worth diving into at this point. For a band that has so much creativity and potential, it hurts to listen to an album like this when so much time and presentation is just a distant memory the second after you listen to it. Listening to Iridescent or Waiting for the End on their own works really well. You just want to listen to 
one track. Listening through the entire album, though, feels like an eternity of trudging through digital madness. Which is also what can be said about all these backtracks that are connecting. They're getting really old. Speaking of which... There are so many more things I should be doing with my life. I should reapply to grad school. This is it, the main event. The Catalyst was the original single to introduce people to the change up in a style for Linkin Park and was the song that started to polarize the long time Linkin Park fans. In total honesty, this is the song that got me excited to buy the new album on day one. The energy and fire is in it from all parties and while it is something in a new direction, it still feels wholly like Linkin Park. The duo of Bennington and Shinoda shine on this song. From beginning to end, the song carries momentum with the right electronic effects and percussion. Lyrically, it's simple but great. It sells the idea of war and crisis. I really can't find anything to nitpick or pull apart. And after 13 tracks, it hits you that they knew how to make tracks like this. Good songs, quality music, and they consistently did it. When I mentioned how when I bought the album and listened to it on my drive home, it was about halfway through the drive when I started realizing that this one song I heard, being the catalyst, was an anomaly. You can't say this is a situation where an album was built around one song because the album was intended to sound the way it does. It's their album, and their story, and their music, and they can tell it however they want. But just because the music comes from a certain band that I like, doesn't mean that everything they produce is automatically scripture. The final song definitely ends on a very different note, both for the album and the band. Hearing an acoustic performance is not a bad way to end things after singing about topics like nuclear war and oppression either. The acoustic guitar works fine too, but the problem I have with this song is Chester's delivery. This song begs to be sung softly and melodic, but I swear you can hear Mr. Bennington's blood vessels burst while screaming along to all this. There are moments of great clarity when he tries to actually calm down a bit, but sweet mercy does it clash overall. Maybe they were going for a juxtaposing style here, but instead of two parts working together, it sounds like a crazy man screaming his head off to a sad rhythm and lyrics of an emo Hallmark greeting card. It's a shame because you can tell this song could have been magical and redefining for the band to show what they were capable of. And that can be said for this entire album as a whole. They had all the pieces for A Thousand Sons to be something legendary and redefining for a new generation, but instead they couldn't resist that urge to stick all their instruments and plug them in into remix generation software. So much of the backing tracks and electronic effects are jarring and do not flow with anything. It's not music you can hit play on and enjoy for the ride. For every song that is lyrically sound, there is one that is forgettable and generic. For every one minute of good quality music, there is another three of poorly structured bridges and remixes spaced out by unnecessary ominous blank space and chaotic electronica and tons and tons of interludes. Even taking in all of the themes pointed out and concepts presented artistically doesn't save a thousand songs. I stand by what I say when playing Wretches and Kings. Just because a song has a good message or references something significant, that doesn't make the song automatically good. I know there are many people out there who love this album. That's fine. Listen to it. Enjoy it. I don't know how you listen to it all the way through from beginning to end, but whatever you do, just love the music you like. But... There is a reason why A Thousand Suns is so polarizing and why it hasn't been done again. The transition from hybrid theory and Meteora to Minutes to Midnight changed things, but it still worked. Even when Living Things came out in 2012, there were many more electronic effects and mixes, but it still felt like an album worth listening to and didn't have several interludes and tracks where only 25% of the song was worth it. It also was different from all the albums before then, too. Changing your style and evolving as musicians 
is. Those aren't bad things. But when you tell people, especially your own fan base, that you have a new vision and it's going to take you to the next level that includes dot .wave downloaded sample files, over 10 minutes of backtracks, and tons of interludes in your full album, of course your fan base is going to feel burned. It's a bait and switch and it's awful. When I wanted a salad, I was told I would be getting something new and satisfying. I still expected a salad though, not a battery acid staple bowl. When Mike Shinoda said the new album would be separate from anything else that's out there, I was still hoping for something complete, and there is a reason there hasn't been anything like it since, as it still today is the elephant in the room for any Linkin Park fan. A Thousand Suns was certified gold in the United States, and for 2010 that is a huge deal. But as this series has proved, album sales do not mean an album is good. I was one of the people who got burned by false hope on a new project based on one song. I placed blind faith in a band I liked even though they said that they were created would be something we never expected. Well they were right. I was expecting something good. We shouldn't put a band on a pedestal and worship everything they make just because of who they are. Just because their intended vision was commendable does not mean that the finished product is worth paying for. And we, including me, should regret blindly supporting a band just because of an underlying message in an album that doesn't automatically make it good. St. Anger from Metallica falls into this category, and so does A Thousand Sons from Linkin Park. There. That should be more than enough fuel for all you angry Linkin Park fans to write me the most rancid, hateful comments on YouTube. I can't believe this asshole on the internet said bad shit about Linkin Park, man. My favorite band. The insane drivel that is coming out of your mouth makes me want to throw up my life force. Linkin Park is the most pure, heavy shit on the planet. You're not special, alright? You are just a weak, stupid, pathetic, white, the uh, white... Chester Bennington is my personal Jesus. Milk, toast, piece of human garbage. How dare you show your own opinion on a site which is founded on reviews of popular culture and such. Your show shouldn't be called Rocks, it should be called, it should be called Sucks, because it sucks. You tried so hard and didn't get so far, but in the end, you don't even matter. Hey everybody, thank you guys for watching. This video was a reach goal made by my patrons who contributed to my Patreon account. If you'd like to contribute, you can click on the YouTube card or the description link and get some perks yourself. Even if it's just a dollar, it helps. Thank you guys for watching. Please like and subscribe. It always helps out a ton. I'm up for suggestions on future regretting the past episodes, and you can watch the previous episode here on Puddle of Buds Come Clean and all its nasally whining. So what? I get 30 seconds and you get 20 minutes? Yeah, I see how it is, bub. Yeah, it's almost like it's my show, bub.